Um, my name is Annie Dale, and I'm here to talk about my experiences as a summer 2013 social justice education fellow in Cambodia. So last May, I traveled to the small, oops, to the small um, Southeast Asian country of Cambodia for three weeks of research. Located in the southern portion of the Indochina Peninsula, Cambodian culture features deep roots in Theravada Buddhism and an intricate connection to the legendary Khmer Empire. Um, and in traditional Cambodia, education was offered typically in Buddhist temples and it was only available for males. However, today's education system is managed by the Cambodian government and is formally available for male and females of all socioeconomic levels. However, through research before my arrival, I noticed an extraordinarily sharp increase in school dropout rates um, in Cambodian children, specifically between primary and secondary schools. So I dedicated my time in Cambodia to researching why this dro sharp dropout rate um, is happening and what is being done about it. <clears throat> so while in Cambodia, I lived in its leading rice producing province, Batambang, among Cambodian neighbors and other international volunteers. I was hosted by the Apostolic Prefecture of Batambang and the amazing Father Enrique Figueredo, who um, is known by all who know him as Father Kike. And they allowed me to tag along with their education team and their outreach team. So Cambodia's history provides a really rich and a complicated base for my research on education. Um, it's essential to mention the horrific Cambodian genocide perpetrated in the 1970s by the Khmer Rouge under the role of the dictator Pol Pot. In the massacre of over two million Cambodians, the Khmer Rouge specifically targeted the educated class and regarded education with undiluted hostility. They executed thousands of teachers and converted many schools into concentration camps. So the effects of this absolute destruction are still tangible today in Cambodia's education system, and that's 30 years after the fall of the Khmer Rouge regime. The genocide unfortunately left an unfathomable need for education with an extreme lack of support for educational institutions in the country. So with these past events haunting Cambodia's presence, I turned to over 20 Cambodians, teachers, students, principals, government workers, and fellow volunteers to get some answers to my question, why is there such a staggering increase in school dropouts specifically between primary and secondary schools? So UNICEF reports that while school participation for both male and females in Cambodia is about 85% for primary schools, secondary, secondary school participation is at only about 44%. So one educator I spoke with expressed his biggest concern for his students as dropping out and not getting the, ed the quality education they deserve as if they were to transfer into secondary school and beyond. So through my research, I identified four contributing factors that were encouraging youth dropouts between primary and secondary school. These factors are lack of parental support, financial inaccessibility, physical inaccessibility, and forced child labor. Um, today, due to time constraints, I'll focus on just one of these factors, and that was the one that I found most compelling and most relevant to my research, and that is the social justice issue of child labor. So while the legal working age in Cambodia is 15 years old, a 2012 study by the World Bank revealed that an estimated one in four Cambodian children between the ages five and 17 is forced to work due to extreme poverty. So that means that there's over 1.5 million child laborers in Cambodia today, and over 75% of them work in hazardous conditions. So many of these children are put to work in their family's rice paddies for 12 hours a day of manual labor, Others, for example, work in brick factories, clothing factories, or in small family-run convenience stores that you can see on the streets when you drive through. Um, as my fellow volunteer, a Cambodian woman with, other f with over 15 years um, working experience working in education told me, the parents often tell the children, quote, why do you need to go study if your family doesn't even have 100 real to buy something? You need to work. Except for in primary school, the children have to work in the field. Another notable trend has developed within the last 15 years. So as Cambodia struggles economically, its Western neighbor, Thailand, has experienced relative economic success as well as minimal monetary inflation. So parents of Cambodian children often leave for Thailand to earn income, forcing their children to go with them and thus pulling them out of school. 
Many people said that they could earn up to five U.S. dollars for a day's work in Thailand while only one or less than one U.S. dollar in Cambodia. So many of the children that will go to the Thai border with their parents will end up picking up trash, begging in the streets, or even working in the sex trade. And child labor is a crucial threat to children of all ages in Cambodia, but especially detrimental to children of secondary school age. That's because this is the age when children are getting big enough and strong enough to be able to work in the field or in factories under poor conditions. And it's also the age in which they are targeted specifically by traffickers. So the, first, the forced labor of children, particularly at the pivotal ages between primary and secondary school, contributes significantly to the staggering dropout rates. Um, but it's also, as I mentioned, connected to and supplemented by lack of parental support, physical inaccessibility, and financial inaccessibility, which you can read about in the full report. So I then asked, what is being done about this? And I identified three functioning strategies to reduce the dropout rates at this specific point in a child's education. These strategies included the establishment of hostel-like homes, um, community outreach and school building, and, as, um, and the administration of rice scholarships. And today I'm just going to focus on discussing the third effort, which is the administration of rice scholarships. So as I mentioned, most of the students are dropping out between primary and secondary school as they are reaching the age of physical maturity necessary to work on their family's rice patties. Identifying this trend of labor forced upon the children by their family, Father Kike and his team came up with a system of rice scholarship to provide the family with a form of conditional compensation for allowing their children to attend school. So Kike's team calculates roughly how much rice the labor of a secondary school aged children could produce um, in a year and to prevent those children from being pulled from the school and forced to work, Kike's team takes that amount and provides the family the same yearly equivalent in monthly increments. Assuming that the rice scholarship makes up for the child's absence in the field, the rice donation is conditional on the child's consistent attendance and performance in schools. The coordinator of the Jesuit Services Cambodia echoes this goal and says, the scholarships try to prove that you have rice already, so please let your chil children go to school. It's a small amount, but it supports the parents and it allows the children to go to school and get an education. Um, with alcoholism and gambling addictions rampant in Cambodian culture, especially among male head of households, the education team provides the family with rice instead of cash to prevent the family from spending irresponsible. So it is conditional. Um, that the children go to school and that the rice is put to good use. And in turn, this method really puts the focus on what really matters, and in this case, it's the child's education. So talking to the family recipients of the rice scholarships was the most inspiring part of my trip to Cambodia, and it was definitely the most, the most rewarding for me. Um, I walked away with, after three weeks of research with a deep admiration for the resiliency of the Cambodian people that you could see in the work that they were doing just 30 years after the, um, after the gen genocide. And this is 30 years after more than one-fourth of their population was brutally wiped out. But I was living among some of the most humble and the most grateful, the most hardworking and the happiest people that I've ever encountered. Um, I often marveled at how Kike and his team, who are amazing, were able to continue working so hard towards education equality in Cambodia's rural youth when the disparity between rich and poor students um, was so significant. But then I got to spend a lot of time with the smiling children there who, above all, they just wanted to go to school with their friends and they wanted to get an education. And so that's why I was taught that this work is so important and why I came back from Cambodia so inspired to write this. So, thank you.